Welcome to Advanced TV Herstory, where hearty discussion of all things TV draws a smart circle around lessons of leadership, persistence, and achievement. Every time you tune in, you'll find fresh perspective and dots that are connected to reveal just how powerful TV is to women and how important it is that we're represented. I bring this to you from my vantage point as a public relations and marketing consultant, as an adjunct professor, and as a lifelong student of TV. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Oh wait, find this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Libsyn, Google Play, and Auto Radio. Engage with us on Twitter. Our handle is at TV Herstory. Okay, on with the show. Welcome, advanced TV historians. We are in for a special treat today. Not that it isn't every podcast that we bring you that is a special treat, but this one is special on top of special because through the wonders of Twitter and exchanges that I've had with um, with Kim Fields, Kim Fields of TV, uh, over over the last year or so, finally we connected on the brink of her having per- published her book, Blessed Life. And uh, so there I was standing in the mall one day and kind of shooting it back and forth with her. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, let's do an interview. <laughs> so um, that is the focus of today's Advanced TV history, And that is to touch base with our, our dear friend, because everybody knows Kim Fields. And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't have strong, fun memories of the facts of life and living single and some really excellent made for TV movies and just her in your life, then read the book and then you will really have this excellent extra appreciation. And the fun, cool thing is, and I'm just saying this out of deep admiration, I just have a feeling like we are at blessed life at this age, at this middle age that we're at. We've got another 40 or 50 good years. You know, you're going to be the Betty White. (laughs) Absolutely. I'll take that. Yes. So... Without further ado, um, Kim Fields and the book Blessed Life. So, Kim, um, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I love following you guys on Twitter. And you are currently out doing promotions right now, correct? I am. I am in New York, and uh, we are doing uh, more of the press tour for the book. And a lot of in-person showing up at independent bookstores and that sort of thing? Well, so far we've done some Barnes & Noble signings, and um, because it is a a very strong faith book, so um, we've also done some church appearances. Um, and uh, lining up more bookstores. And what would you say in one word, in one word, what is the reaction as you appear, make, make appearances with this book? How do people react to you? Oh, they're, I mean, they're really excited. You know, um, they're excited for the book. They're excited to um, see me in person. You know, it's one of those, they um, feel like they know me and they see me on various things. Um, I'm very active on social media, so they feel like that's another connection but to have that in person and to take a picture and to you know tell me what their favorite memories are from you know any part of the journey it's it's really been cool that is so powerful and we're going to talk a little bit more about that feedback because I think that that's that's some of the um uh, you know, you've got that in your heart and you've obviously, you know, received so much of that through your life of the impact you've had with with viewers. Mm-hmm. But I'm hopeful we can talk a little bit more and dig deeper because that's really where I think the impact, the impact of women in media is is is, is an untold story. So but but let's talk about the told story, the one mm-hmm. that you've written in your book. And mm-hmm. why did you decide now um, at this at this age and this sure. stage, motherhood and everything? Well, you know, celebrating 40 years in the industry, um, 40 years of doing anything feels very much like a milestone. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it just was one of those things where it felt like it was a good time to um, not stop and reflect, um, but do a quick pause and and, and kind of watch a highlight reel, if you will. Uh, And so, you know, I also felt like people feel like they know me, like we've just been saying. And yet there were things that we haven't talked about. There were things that we haven't touched upon. Um, So it just seemed like now was a good time. Um, and, uh, while well, everything is still in forward motion, you know, with, um, work and, and motherhood and, and, and spousehood and everything, mm-hmm. um, to be able to, to put it, uh, in perspective. 
And motherhood, you have two relatively youngins, I say, yeah. as the mother of a 23 and 26 year old. So oh my, um, yes. tell us a little bit about about their situation and and kind of how you're feeling about motherhood here in in the 21st sure. century, all plugged in. You, yeah. You're going to have like digital natives plus. Absolutely. Um, definitely, you know, raising a, a digital uh, generation. Um, and it's great. I love being a mom. I love being a mom of boys in particular. Um, and uh, my husband and I were very, very grateful for the blessing. And, you know, it wasn't like we had plotted and planned and strategized to wait until, you know, we were older in terms of, you know, chill, having children. Um, you know, my husband and I didn't even meet until I was in my mid thirties. Um, and so being able to then have children in your late thirties and early forties, um, it's a def- it's definitely a different perspective. Um, but it's, it's one that really fits us and works for us, you know, because you're able to, um, share your wisdom without your baggage. Mm-hmm. And, and if I can just belabor motherhood for one more moment, mm-hmm. and the, the fact that you have this incredibly close relationship with your mother, who has mm-hmm. been just, she has been so much a part of your life. Mm-hmm. Does she uh, provide you then either um, parenting advice or, or do you and she just have such a, a unique relationship that, uh, that she gives you the, the wide berth to do what you need right. to do with your boys? She's, she's incredibly complimentary to Chris and I about our parenting. She is always telling us that she's very proud of us uh, and, you know, that the proof is in the pudding and she sees how her grandsons are, are, are you know, being raised and, and the character that they are developing and, and who they are growing to be. So she's always complimentary. She doesn't um, give, you know, parental advice or anything like that. Um, her, her thing is just, you know, she, she marvels at us and, and that feels really good. Fun, fun. And, and she has, she was on Living Single, uh, a couple of appearances, correct? That is correct. She played my yeah. mother on Living Single and on Facts of Life. Oh my goodness. I, I mm-hmm. don't know that I made that connection all yeah. the way back. So gang, as you're watching, uh, reruns out there, uh, watch specifically for Kim's mother, Chip, uh-huh. Who, who should write her own book because she too had a bit of a fascinating experience and and the Pearl Bailey stuff is um, you meant so yeah. uh, I'm jumping ahead but in the book uh, there's there's some Pearl Bailey references which you can't be uh, a f- fan of Pearl Bailey as as mm-hmm. I am and not see the parallels of Queen Latifah so yes. I, I just think that there is a that often. Um, there's a character that that America needs there's there's a, an array of characters that America needs who sort of sustain uh, hope and they're they're diverse entertainers they they've got a wide range of of just uh, capacity to deliver mm-hmm. and I think that you you definitely can travel in the universe of really solid entertainers who have maintained their integrity and who have maintained their reputation. And I, I give you a lot of credit and I give your mother credit for instilling those values Thank you. Uh, in your yeah. life and, and, and protecting you. It's really, in, uh, in some it's cases. really um, mind boggling, quite honestly, to me, how my mother raised me and what she, um, uh, what she instilled in me and what she exposed me to in terms of, um, some really uh, iconic and legendary people, um, and and sometimes you don't know that you know they're, they're not iconic at the time. Um, they're just great, mm-hmm. or, or they're just um, impactful, um, and you don't know that they're trailing, they're, they're blazing the trail at that moment. Um, but I'm, I'm and, and I say I'm, I'm astounded that she did that because she was very young. She was 18 when she had me, uh, and so mm-hmm. for her to have that sort of um, you know, thought process is, is just really interesting to me. And would you say then that as you were reflecting and going through the process of writing this book, was that the, the big revelation that dawned on you? Or did you have a couple that as you looked back upon your life, you just saw these seminal moments or seminal people who influenced you? I think it's you? A, with reflection because you don't know, like I said, you don't know that there are, you, you know that they are, um, they're influential at the moment, but in terms of the, the really ginormous impact 
um, you don't know that, at least for me, until you've got some hindsight. Mm -hmm. And and so was there anything that sort of uh, came to light as a result of your reflection for this book? Did you kind of... There's um, there's, there's certainly my mother's tenacity uh, and and her sacrifice and and her humility, uh, and specifically Carl Bailey. Um, you know, the story about how my mother got the role in Hello, Dolly uh, on Broadway uh, and, uh, and you know, going to get Miss Bailey some soup and, 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 and how she was just, Miss Bailey just loved her. And then to find out that Miss Bailey, uh, my grandmother, my mother's mother was a dancer in Ms., one of Miss Bailey's um, cabaret shows. I didn't know that until I was doing research for this book. Um, and so it's it's just really you know what I find is is passed down through my cultural DNA as well as my uh, my bloodline uh, is certainly um, the tenacity of the people that have been before me uh, and the idea of not wanting to be a statistic um, but to really continue to work hard and 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 create those experiences and moments for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, the Pearl Bailey references are some of the highlights of the book. It is kind of amazing. I find in reading um, celebrity mm-hmm. autobiographies, I am drawn to them. Mm-hmm. Taraji P. Henson uh, published one actually now like a, a year and a half ago. I mean, her, she's lived a, a whole different life since then. And Candace Bergen has mm-hmm. written a couple. And the the very just sort of you hone in on a couple of stories where they these people become totally relatable. And so I find you um, you have just lived a life. You've just lived a life with different experiences than the rest of us, but that you still you know put on your tights or your <laughs> yoga pants one yes. leg at a time. Um, and um, and so uh, please, please tell the story, uh, because I think that it's inspirational of your Liza Minnelli moment yes. and and how it is, uh, you know, everything. Liza Minnelli is like the Kevin Bacon for women, I swear. It's like everything can go back right. to Liza Minnelli, who, who, according to Candace Bergen, they were all they went to each other's three-year-old birthday party Wow! because that was when Edgar Bergen was living like three doors down from Judy Garland. Garland. Yeah. Wow. Mm. (laughs) So so there you are. You're, you're having a dark moment. You're in the middle of your career. So, um, I was, I was in what I call the dark ages for myself. Um, I was, I had, I had gone through my, my only divorce. I had finished doing living single um, and uh, I was in a space of not working, and my production company that I had had uh, nothing. There was no not, no fruit from from that you know labor, and I honestly just felt like I didn't have anything else to give you know my spirit, my soul, anything. And so I just shut down, and I I, I and not in that positive way. I shut down in a negative way of just. I'm just going to close the drapes and I'm not going to do anything. And um, I was watching an interview. This went on for weeks, uh, if not a couple months. And so I was watching an interview with Liza Minnelli. And she was saying that um, she was talking about, you know, the things that she's had to battle and some of her uh, darkness as well. And she said that she, what brought her out this time was she went and looked at her father's work. And I thought she was going to say her mother's work. And she said, I looked at my father's work and I realized I come from that stock. And that was so, that was, that was a, a revelation for me. And I went and I, I looked at my spiritual father's work. I went and looked at the sky and the mountains and breathed in air and the sunshine and opened the drapes and went outside. And I said, I come from that stock. This is my father's work and I come from that stock. And I find it, you know, certainly uh, very surreal and amazing that, like you said, yes, Liza Minnelli, uh, her her transparency at that point would be what would pull me out and inspire me. But nevertheless, it, it did, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Oh, that's a great story, and 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 that lesson of sort of. Uh, Remind, reminding yourself of your value, your experiences, 
and from from whom or from whence you came. Do you find yourself um, building this in your sons either through uh, through the religious exposure to the to the time you spend within your your religion and and um, Christian communities? Mm-hmm. And or is this kind of part of the legacy and the storytelling you do now that you have the Pearl Bailey story of your grandmother mm-hmm. and, and the tremendous work of your mother? How are you instilling this respect for, for DNA and, mm-hmm. and family pride? How do you do that with your, with your boys? Well, one, I recognize that, you know, we're raising sons and that's obviously very different than raising daughters and not wanting to push them into any one area like the arts or anything um but making sure number one that they know this history when i was recording the audiobook for blessed life the uh wonderful director that i worked with he said your 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 sons are going to be so grateful that you've done this because while it's for everyone they have a bit of their legacy and a strong cornerstone of their family history and legacy And I hadn't even put it into place like that. Um, But certainly the the pillars of character that I gleaned from Miss Bailey and and just some of the other Norman Lear, Maxine Waters, people that have been, um, you know, instrumental in in my life and growth and development, instilling those pillars of hard work, um, strength of character, um, tenacity, tenacity. vision and, and, and dreaming, um, and then working hard, planning, strategizing. Those are the things that I, I've learned from the giants that are in my life. And do you think that based on sort of that go around that with um, um, spiraling to a bit where you felt like you were in such a low place, do you think that that'll ever come again? Or do you think that the Liza Minnelli um, the, the, the awakening mm-hmm. that took place and the, and the right. connection, um, that that has in a sense, uh, instilled a, a greater strength for you, made you a little more resilient. Uh, it certainly made me more resilient. Um, but, but I'd be, you know, ridiculous if I thought for a moment that that could not happen again. The beauty is that I can see it coming. The beauty is, you know, when I find myself getting close to that place of, such disappointment or such frustration or a tremendous lack of understanding. Before I allow allow myself to get to that dark space, I'm able to see it coming. I'm able to, again, revisit my father's work. I'm able to glean, you know, from my wonderful husband. And when he sees it coming, you know, and one of the things he said was, I wasn't there then. I'm here now. So I can help you Mm -hmm. when I see that kind of energy coming on your spirit. And he has been there to be able to remind me of things like my joy and my peace and things that I may not, Mm. um, you know, yes, you acknowledge that you're blessed, but then you also in the very same breath can get weighted down with the grind and the hustle. And this has got to get done. It's got to get done like this. And I'm grateful for this blessing, but now I got to do this. And it's like, Hey, wait a minute. You didn't provide this blessing to begin with, nor the last blessing. <laughs> well, he, he sounds like a terrific guy. And, and I wish he really is. I wish you many, many years of, um, of fun parenting. The, the fun years are just ahead for you. So. Oh, um, yes. I say that from experience. So the, as I said, I, you know, I, I pour through celebrity biographies, autobiographies, anything that's written and, and have to be a judge of, of how it's written um, mm-hmm. in order to, it, it, sadly, I think some celebrities write their memoirs at a different level. And so I did an entire episode where I... Um, recognize that this is the first Mother's Day that we had without Florence Henderson. And she is yes. America's mother as Carol Brady. <laughs> and her 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 autobiography was really quite, a, a, it was rich storytelling, but it was mm-hmm. pretty superficial, I'll say. And mm-hmm. the part that I really wish she had borne in a little more detail about was helping us understand how Carol Brady made such, ha, ha, was, was she, she had fans around the world telling her how important that show was to them, how it got them through a period in their own growth that yeah. 
changed their lives, that, mm-hmm. that helped them see things differently, that was a, a sense of stability. So mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you to, to go back as far into your 40 years as you want. And the feedback and the connection with fans, what, do, what has Regine and Tootie meant to your fans and particularly the women fans? How have you changed lives? Well, I wouldn't know how I've changed lives. I can only, you know, speak on what people have told me and and shared with me and continue Mm -hmm. to, you know. um, I mean, you see the comments that people have about the book. Um, But I know um, from facts of life, um, you know, from things that are are more fun or funny, uh, lots of people telling me they would get in trouble for roller skating in the house because (laughs) Tootie did. Um, but, you know, culturally speaking, and, and in particular for black women and at the time black girls, um, you know, things like I, I wore my hair like you. Um, when Netflix did that campaign, the first time I saw me, I was um, I, I was I was incredibly moved and honored that so many people said that I was the first time they saw them, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and the impact of that. Um, being very surreal, uh, but one that I don't take for granted. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and again, not just in terms of things like hairstyles. Um, there are lots of women who have told me, I went to boarding school because of you, or I was the only black girl in my environment and I was okay. You know, you taught me how to, how to, how to do that. Um, with living single, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the most, I was just told, one of the most iconic online uh, tests, I think they call it, or s- surveys or something, um, is, you know, which character are you most like from living single? <laughs> and and so I, I love that when people, I love how they love these characters, you know, um, mm-hmm. that they are not only relatable and entertaining, but they are inspiring. When people say, I wanted to have my own magazine. I wanted to be a lawyer or a stockbroker. I wanted to go into fashion because of racing, all these different things. Um, you know, you realize that the, it's such a very thin line between entertainment and, and life, real life, and how people are, mm-hmm. are genuinely inspired by that. And then, of course, I love such random things. I've gotten into so many taxis over my career, and the driver will say, <laughs> I learned to speak English watching Facts of Life. Um, oh, you know, I've gotten so many people that say, I would watch your show with my sister or my brothers and my mom and dad. And that was one of the last times I can remember watching as, as a family. Um, those things are really important. And, I, and I, I, I understand that. And I don't take that lightly. And you, you were on two sitcoms that were not just geared toward, you know, kind of um, lowbrow humor and uh, and kind of sloppy writing. Yeah. The 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 presence of Facts of Life as a Norman Lear production, yeah. correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, meant that is signing on. You were signing on for yet one more sort of um, twist of the kaleidoscope of some of the social issues that he felt, yes. having read his autobiography, mm, were were important. Yes. that was. Yeah. That was the the essence of the medium of television was right. to get into living rooms, yes. and Norman felt this he had the best way to crack mm-hmm. the nut to create the discussion. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about both the living single or the the facts of life, mm-hmm. some of those social issues that got brought forward, and then we'll jump over to to living single because they sure. were two distinct shows and they were valued so differently. Very it much felt so. like well, absolutely. And, and so and it, you're going to be living with those legacies and I think uh, still continue to hear sort of different different sets of experiences from the unique audiences that they served. So facts of life, some of those social Absolutely. issues. Sure. Well, we dealt with social issues, um, you know, that were that were taboo almost, you know, from from at that time, you know, it was a hot button topic of, of smoking pot, as they said, Um uh, uh, we, we dealt with teen suicide, uh, which then gave way uh, for me to be able to testify in front of Congress about teen suicide at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we dealt with race, 
you know, uh, we dealt with um, image issues. Uh, oh, body, and, and you you deal with the body yeah. image issues Absolutely. from your time in the book, yes. Yeah, very much so, very much so. So the thing about it was, you know, just being relevant. What's unfortunate, and I've heard Norman speak about this before, um, is that history, when he talks about history repeating itself, unfortunately. So you can watch an episode of Good Times or Facts of Life now, and unfortunately, some of the same stuff that we were dealing with back then, come on, y'all, we're still dealing with this now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's some, some of the essence of this podcast is that mm-hmm. we have not made the kind of progress um, mm-hmm. uh, in conversation that we probably should have had, let alone having it actually embedded as a, as cultural change the way that I think 40 years ago, we all thought was was happening, was going to be the course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then also Jerry Jewell was on for a handful of episodes, Mm -hmm. sort of bringing forth yet another aspect of diversity that remains underrepresented very much so on tv and do you still stay in touch with jerry we do we all stay in touch with each other mindy just sent me a text last night because she was with charlotte at an event and so those two hooligans were having some fun (laughs) (laughs) um we um we um we all still keep in touch everybody although not Um, as much with george clooney maybe (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, some 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 are not quite as frequent as others, but he did send a, a wonderful greeting uh, to Charlotte last spring uh, when her book, her autobiography was released, and we all enjoyed getting to see that. Um, but yes, going back to the social issues, you're right. Uh, having Jerry on was groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, talking about and, and revealing some of the issues that come with um, just being diverse on so many different issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that it, it, it's, it, it's the hallmark of a classic TV show. And I think that that's why Facts of Life will always be uh, set aside as, um, as, a, as a legacy show of quality television or mm-hmm. sort of the second golden age of television, as some people mm-hmm. call it. Mm -hmm. And then you were fortunate that you were able to sort of grow out of the 2D 2D look and the Mm -hmm. and the vibe Mm -hmm. and reinvent yourself as more of the uh, the tart in living single, which had then um, it's its own (laughs) its own. Yeah, its own realm. And then all of a sudden was quickly overshadowed by friends. So, Mm -hmm. you know. How do, how do you feel about that? Even today, what do your fans say and and what do you say? Well, they, they see the truth. They see the writing on the wall. They see that it's really not, you know, some sort of mystery um, that that living single was a precursor in so many ways and, and groundbreaking in so many ways um, to, to a, a very small handful of shows. Um, you know, and it is what it is. That's kind of the nature of, of the industry. Where, where, you know, the frustration would come into play when you're in the moment uh, is that sense of, well, well, don't act like that didn't happen, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, you know, it's one thing to, you know, say, well, you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery, but don't ignore the person that you're imitating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there's that. Um, but having said that, you know, at the end of the day, um, we we love the lane that we created and that Yvette specifically created. Now to, there's somebody to talk to for you, man, because um, she mm. she was um, she 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 was so unassuming in her in her trailblazing efforts. You know, you mm-hmm. just think you're writing a good show. You just you're hoping you're writing a good show and writing characters mm-hmm. that are relatable and that your storytelling is is intriguing and and she did all of that you know and in the face of never having done it before right and so few young women of color on tv as the main characters in a professional capacity so you know if you go all the way back to 1968 and julia yes that happened Mm -hmm. and 
And then, you know, um, on Room 222, uh, mm-hmm. a, a tremendously diverse cast and and um, teachers and administrators of color. And so, you know, you can kind of you can you can plot them as supporting characters, maybe even as, you know, leads, but not for women in the in the in the realm of the 90s where there was an assumption of college education and there was an assumption of of professional growth and and the show just is not given the credit that it deserves or at least not not universally and well, I'm, and that's that's often the case. I mean, you know, if you go back to Facts of Life, Facts of Life was not a critical success, but it was a fan favor for nine years. Um, mm-hmm. And it wouldn't be until much later that people really dissected and gave us our, our flowers while we were above ground, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> the same holds true with Living Single. Um, right now, you know, and, and with, you know, the talk of possible reboot or... Um, or those sorts of things. Uh, but even before that happened, um, people were always fully aware. It's just now coming out more so because of social media being able to give people a platform for their so treasured appear, uh, 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 opinions. But mm-hmm. to be able to, um, you know, see everyone's comments and feedback and not just people of color. Let me be clear on that. Not just people of color and not just women, but people, the, the, the audience, the viewing audience, they see, oh, wait a minute, this was first, that happened, but we were, you know, NBC was a bigger network than Fox at the time, you know, and sure. that was one of the main things. Yep. And this is, you know, it's, it's, it's show business. It's the business of show. So you can't take it personally. You do what you got to do, call people out on it, and then keep it pushing. Go to therapy if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> and in the and in the fifteen years or so, I guess since living single, what twelve years? It ended in what two thousand five? No, living single ended in ninety eight. Right? No, in uh-huh. ninety eight. Oh, I'm I'm I had girlfriends in my Again, in my head. We were the so girlfriends mm-hmm. followed. Speak on it. Yes. Yeah, and and here we are now with Blackish. So, do you think Blackish represents? As a, as a comedy, um, because we're not going to get into to dramas and the mm-hmm. Shonda Rhimes, you know, uh, vehicles and everything. But as a comedy, do you think Blackish now finally has kind of planted a flag in the in the earth that that things won't regress, that there will sort of always be a strong, um, a, a strong, a, a very strong comedy that is going to be out there? Do you, I mean, do you have no, hope for that? I, I, I don't have hope for any of it from the standpoint of, I hope it does more than what it's supposed to do, which is first and foremost, get ratings for people to, you know, watch it and not get canceled. I mean, that's first and foremost, any TV Mm -hmm. show's goal is to get ratings. Um, And, and, you know, you hope that, that, you know, right dovetailed into that is be a good show to get ratings. There mm-hmm. are bad shows mm-hmm. that have ratings. Amen. For whatever yes. reason. But that's not <laughs> what we're talking about right now. Um, but but that that's the goal of, of, of TV shows. Um, I don't think it's fair to place the burden and the pressure on any one show, any one showrunner or filmmaker or anything um, to, mm-hmm. to, you know, be the be all end all for a race of people. Uh, for a generation of people, uh, I thought that was unfair back in the '90s when, you know, they said they were they were acting as if Spike Lee was the voice of black people. No, he's a voice for some black people. And then there's John Singleton. Mm-hmm. And why does that only happen with people of color? You know, anybody running around wondering if uh, the Good Doctor is going to be the medical drama for all white folks? I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, but you see how that sounds? But, but there, are the, there are things that, again, that, that you know, I think that they put undue um, burden and undue pressure on. Now, Blackish is an incredible show, has been groundbreaking in its own right. Um, but again, mm-hmm. that's because they are walking in, boldly walking in, their, their creativity first and foremost and their success. 
But, mm-hmm. you know, again, mm-hmm. let's not put the pressure on them. Like, you guys are the, the show now. Well, <laughs> what about another show that might come along? You know, so so that that's just, that's, that's I, and I realize I see things a little differently than most people and most people in the industry, mm-hmm. but I do have a voice and I do have a platform to offer up hey, try looking through these lenses for a minute before you just haul off and start talking. Sure. Well, I, I guess I, I look at it in the in the context of what had been the, the tremendous community of talent brought together by Bill Cosby, which sort of paralleled sort of the Grant Tinker um, school of quality television that was emerging out of the 70s and early 80s. And they, they just created so many different talented people who went on to lead and and impact other shows Mm -hmm. and that was behind the camera as well as in front of the camera then you had the bill cosby i love that you referenced the great grant tinker proceed and and so you know and so bill cosby as a result of just that and take his his personal situation aside you know felicia felicia rashad is Mm -hmm. is consummate now and 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 raven simone will be with us in some capacity doing tremendously creative things and malcolm jamal warner so you have this this network that has um sort of stepped out and so now it's kind of a spoken hub and now we have lots of different spokes Mm -hmm. emanating from that we have spokes emanating from living single I would hope that we have stronger ones then that come out of Blackish that prove that you can either have a single show in its aggregate that that is that big breakthrough, but as a result, the sparks that fly out become the talented mm-hmm. uh, the the spin off that they that they are planning as well as the mm-hmm. tremendous experience that people are getting behind the scenes. But that's a that's a format and a formula that is not new, nor is it. Um, you know, uh, specific to um, people of color on television. Um, Trapper John MD was mm-hmm. a quasi spinoff from MASH because they took the Trapper John character and gave him a show. Um, Facts of Life was a mm-hmm. spinoff from Different Strokes to Mrs. Garrett. Uh, and then if you've got talented people in your cast, well, God help them. I hope they all find other work after the show that they're on <laughs> so you know yeah yes, and, and so, that's right so not just because that. they were on a black show but just because that's the nature of folks got to work and, and you know get a check but at the end of the day i i hear what you're saying in terms of um blackish like i said blazing its own trail um even as it stands on the shoulders of those who have come before and they are doing, you know, great things creatively on their own show and spinning off Baby Girl. Brilliant. Spinning her off onto another network within their structure of networks. Super brilliant. I am mad at you at all. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, again, I mean, <laughs> going back to Friends, they all work for the most part and not as those characters. Um, because again, if you're a good actor, then hopefully you, you still work. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't look sure. at it through the lens of, of, you know, just kind of it being for, um, people of color or shows that have any sort of, um, social narrative within their, within their creativity. Well, that, and that's, uh, that sort of leads me into the next direction that I would like for you to talk about. And that is you are, uh, well, you're, you're well-versed in the industry. You're well-versed across the, the context of the industry in relation and, and entertainment in relation to cultural change and social pressures and politics and political movements that, that have stalled and some that accelerated in ways that we never expected. And you touch on some of your uh, political experience mm-hmm. as a, as a supporter or as an activist in your book. And that's another reason for people to buy a blessed life book by Kim Fields. Um, it just, it feels to me like you're ready for a talk show. Is that, is that something you'd be interested in doing or how are that you going to carry your voice forward? Sure. Um, looking at um, the platforms that I currently have and how we expand them and take them to the next level for uh, 2018 and beyond. Um, being in the talk show space in some capacity is definitely on the table. Uh, there are certain things that we've already got in the can in terms of some content. 
Um, so that, mm-hmm. that is absolutely something that people can expect to uh, hear more of and be a part of as well. I, I just I think you're you're a natural for it. You've got this distinct voice of experience that for your age and your sort of connectivity is, you know, it's it's got a bit of an Oprah feel to it. So I, uh, I wish you. you all the best in advancing that part forward, because if you don't do that, then you're going to have to run. <laughs> you're you're going to have to succeed Maxine Waters right. or Ted right. Lieu or whoever right. in California and run for Congress and. And I'd move there and vote for you if it weren't in flames right (laughs) now. Well, thank you. I I don't live in California anymore, but uh, thank you for that. Yes, um, I I basically, (laughs) um, you know, when I went to Pepperdine, I double majored uh, TV and film production and broadcast journalism. Uh, So that's a part of why I'm very comfortable in this space. I have a degree in it. Um, I I have done Mm -hmm. internships in this realm. Uh, and then, of course, just, you know, doing it, I've hosted and, you know, done, done several different things in this in this space. Um, so so it is, like I said, something that I'm looking to do and 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 kind of open up in that in that genre a little bit more. But how we do it, that's what's important. So you're not thinking of running for Congress and, you know, you've got <laughs> well, some great you, pictures that have already been no, taken. No, at the moment, and funny, Charlotte <laughs> Ray said this about me years ago that I could run for office, but I, I, I don't <clears throat> see that on my uh, most immediate horizon. I'm open to, you know, whatever God has for me. Um, and should that be revealed that that's part of, you know, my journey, then, you know, I'm going to jump on that with, you know, just and just be all in. At the moment, though, that's that's not where where I think my voice and my power uh, would be best used. Well, you are you are self aware enough, and that that comes through loud and clear in your book. That I'm I'm certain you are uh, in in good in good connection with kind of where your vibes are and where you believe your strengths can best be used, and and the blessings that you've been given. So uh, so let's talk a little bit more then about. Either uh, the talk show format, some of the platforms that you just mentioned, or more importantly, some of the production experience mm-hmm. you have. And are you going to be putting that to use in the in the coming years? Do you have some projects that you're working on where you're the leader, where you're the, the behind the scenes sure. maker? Yes, I just think to deal with uh, Lifetime to develop a TV movie for them for 2018. Uh, and I'm uh, executive producer on that. Uh, and um, so that's really uh, exciting. Uh, this uh, season, you know, this is the time that we always relaunch and reestablish uh, our holiday brand, Holiday Love, of which my husband and I are executive producers. Uh, and then mm-hmm. um, looking into how uh, I, I kind of um, re-energize who I am and what my voice is and how I use it. Uh, in terms of the, the social space, uh, in terms of social uh, justice or injustice, um, social awareness, and that sort of thing. So, so there are definitely some some projects where um, I'm, I'm definitively the either executive producer on or executive producer and director. And which do you find more fun or more fulfilling? I love it all. I Producing still, or directing? I, I honestly love it all. I still... Truly adore my industry, the good, bad, and, and the ugly, because of the impact. You know that 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 you can have, you can you can inspire, you can um, evoke change, you can um, show others that they are powerful. You can tell amazing stories of, of phenomenal people. So um, I still love my industry. I still love acting. There's so many characters in me that still yet to be uh, brought out of me. Um, so, so I, I'm, I'm in it, you know, I'm in it for the long haul. And, and, you know, like you said at the beginning, uh, yeah, we could keep doing this another 40 years. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Um, so again, we have been talking with Kim Fields about her book, Blessed Life and about her blessed life and some of the highlights that she puts into the book. And has placed in the book as well as uh, just some thoughts that I had as I have kind of consistently read other mm-hmm. memoirs of 
uh, people who have changed lives from their experience or their exposure on TV or in film. So you are in the midst of book promotion. You mentioned that you've recorded the audio book. Help us understand. Oh, and I did have somebody say to me, yeah, I saw the Kim Fields book at the airport. And I'm like, yes, all right, oh, I'll good, mention that. Sure was looking. Where can we I was looking it? in the airport when I was flying to New York and I was <laughs> in the Atlanta airport. I was looking like... Is it in there? But I was rushing, so I had to move <laughs> quickly. Um, but you can buy the book at Barnes & Noble, at Amazon, uh, iTunes. It can be downloaded. Uh, and again, uh, it's a uh, hardback uh, download uh, audio book. Um, it makes a great gift. My mother, you'll see me post this uh, sometime this week. My mother did her holiday decorating at home. And she put uh, a book in all of the stockings as stocking stuffers all over her house. <laughs> oh. um, but you can definitely buy, uh, buy the book where books are sold. Excellent. And independent bookstores, too, because, of course, we love our indie bookstores. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was blessed to yeah. go to uh, their, for, well, for the Southern Independent Booksellers Convention. I went to their convention in New Orleans uh, uh, this summer. Uh, and they really, really love the book and, and, you know, certainly ordered plenty of copies for you if you do go to uh, and support the independent bookseller, which I, I love independent bookshops myself. Great. And how can we follow you on social media, Kim? Uh, well, of course, you know, I am Kim V. Fields <laughs> on Twitter, Kim V. and Victoria Fields on Twitter. So again, on Twitter, it's at Kim V. Fields. On Instagram, it's Kim Fields Official. And on Facebook, it's Kim Fields. And then do you have a, an official website? Oh, uh, yes. Something that, that kind of gets into your project? <laughs> yes, sorry. Kimfields.com. Excellent. Absolutely. And you can also order personalized books there, uh, which is the only place. That's the exclusive place that you can get. Um, why I've, I'm doing uh, some personal uh, notes uh, and and my signature and that sort of thing. So that's the place where you can get person, uh, you know, personalized notes from me at kimfields dot com. Excellent. One one last thing on the on the book. One last thing is having been a, a staff person and a PR person, I am uh, well uh, well versed in the fact that none of this can happen without a great team of people helping you, as well as the great family that you've mentioned. So, is there anyone that you want to give a shout out to? Members of the team who have helped make this uh, book possible, just on the on the day to day basis. Sure. Maybe they didn't make it into the credits of the book, but um, right. Uh, who helped you get here today, Kim? Well, Todd Gold, who certainly is, is, is a part of the credits in, in the book and, and my acknowledgments. Todd Gold is my ghostwriter, and he was so instrumental with his expertise. You have to look him up. He's got a tremendous uh, a catalog of biographies and autobiographies that he's worked on. And um, just really great at helping me shape all of the information, you know, and making sure that my voice um, was loud and clear. And so I'm, I'm just eternally grateful for him for going through this process with me. Um, and then in terms of my team, who were definitely, you know, acknowledged in the book, uh, Art Rudder and Paul Wright and Valerie Enlow, um, my, my, my publicist who helped to, you know, connect us today, uh, Michelle mm -hmm. and Simone with Strategic Heights, uh, they're fantastic, just a phenomenal PR firm. Um, so thank you for asking. Oh, and of course, you know, the glams and <laughs> Dana and Brian and legend. That's my New York glam. They're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, always got me looking far more amazing than I ever <laughs> thought possible. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it, it, every day you, you kind of have to take stock of a blessed life as you have. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of a reminder that we are all surrounded by great people. And it sounds like you are as well. And we wish you the best. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Like I said at the beginning, I love following you. <laughs> all right. And, and if you're ever in Chicago, if you're ever in Chicago. My uh, city. I up. love all Chicago. Right. Thank you so much. SRO. Now there's a shout out. I love, and they know I love their turkey burger. Burgers and turkey chili. 
Oh my goodness. SRO on printer's row. What? <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, that's, uh, wow. We've just expanded our, uh, our mission here at advanced TV Hershery, but we appreciate <laughs> your taking the time this morning. Wish you all the best in continued promotion and sharing your stories around your book, blessed Thank life you. and, uh, have a, have a great holiday season. Thank Kim. you. You too. And you keep doing what you're doing. You're doing such an important work. I was so thrilled to discover oh. you. You keep on keeping on truly. Thank you. Bless your heart. Loyal listeners, it has been great fun bringing you this interview with Kim Fields. What a class act. And she's absolutely right about her terrific team of publicists. They were a great group to work with. Kim has lived TV history and will continue to do so because she's really only eh, 48. And she will continue wearing all the hats that she loves and that fit her so well. And aren't we the fortunate ones to be able to have seen her grow to this point and now really hit her stride? And I don't think it's going out on a limb to say that we all need more Kim Fields to be present behind the scenes as well as in front of the camera. Because let's face it, if we're looking to identify with women, particularly women of color, On TV, we are outnumbered and outresourced every day. Whether it's on news analyst panels or sports coverage of women or just speaking roles in regular TV dramas, our voice and our presence is just outnumbered. Our voices are marginalized. We don't have an hour, let alone weekends worth of coverage across numerous channels that cover the actions of women in and of TV. But what if we did? What if we had an hour to celebrate the great work of women of TV and the important roles and the moments that shape our today, that shape what we're thinking today, and how much more confident we'd feel and how it would become so much more natural for us as women to speak in glowing, honoring tones about the work of other women, not catty, but rather supportive, gushing, and that it's normal. So it's this storytelling that we're missing, and it's the importance of representation, that's the very conversation that you just heard me have with Kim, that we need to demand. We've grown positively desensitized to the absence of diversity. We don't notice it. We're not able to see the wealth of talent that could create a totally different TV landscape, one that speaks to us all and represents us all. So where can we go to have this kind of analysis and understanding? Until such time as that sort of show reaches TV, rest assured you'll find it here at Advanced TV Herstory. Subscribe on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Auto Radio, places wherever you find podcasts. Or play it directly off of our podcast website, www.tvherstory.com. My thanks to David Brown, audio technician extraordinaire, And the music that you have heard in this episode, as always, is Jazzer's Take Me Higher, and it can be found at Free Music Archive. Your recommendations, listeners, mean the world to me. So please, when you have the opportunity in conversation to talk about this, one of your favorite podcasts, do share, and perhaps help someone, a new listener, someone who's never even listened to podcasts, master the easiest way for him or her to listen. I consider it to be the greatest compliment if you would do that. And um, yeah, appreciate it. Our Twitter handle is at TV Herstory. Our email is advanced TV Herstory at gmail.com. Do post a line, send me a note. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know who else I should be interviewing. Some great face from the past. It's never been more important for women and girls to see themselves on TV all colors, shapes, and interests, the very things that we experience in our lives and the people we experience in our lives. The only way this will happen is for women to reclaim our status. We need to band together to educate, celebrate, and fortify one another. So please be part of this important conversation. Stay in touch. This is why I podcast. I'm Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Thanks for listening. 